So we'll be talking about locating the body organs and structures as well as body systems. So when you're locating body organs and structures, uh, we use visualization. Uh, so if you know roughly where it is in the body, we can um, visualize just that area, or um, you can visualize an uh, area that is near that's easy to see, um, such as the nipple, you know, is near the heart or the lungs. So if it's a thing that you can visually see on the body, that's one way to identify it. And then topography is another way to identify things, which um, can come from feeling things. Uh, if you ever gone to a doctor's office and they're just doing a checkup on you, they'll a lot of times like feel your neck and they're feeling for lymph nodes there, and you feel the topography around uh, that area, which will help you identify where some structures are. So the musculoskeletal system is very large. It consists of all of our muscles and all of our bones, which bones alone we have 206 of. You won't have to memorize all of them. We just kind of touched on some of the big ones that we deal with. <clears throat> uh, again, the musculoskeletal system has three main functions. First one is it gives the body shape. Uh, it gives it the actual structure. Secondly, it protects your vital organs. Uh, if you think of like your rib cage, uh, that's your musculoskeletal system protecting your lungs and your heart, which are vital internal organs. It also provides your body movement. Muscles attached to uh, your bones is what can allow us to actually make movement. So your skeleton, as I said, it has 206 bones in the entire human body. Uh, but it consists of your skull and spine, um, branching off your spine near your ribs and sternum, uh, your shoulders and your upper extremities or your arms, the pelvis, and then your lower extremities or your legs. Your skull is the bony structure of your head. Um, its main function is to protect your brain from injury. Uh, the top, back, and sides of the skull, the part that actually goes around the brain, is called your cranium. And then your face is the front of the skull, which has several different bones in it. So your facial bones uh, are your mandible, which is your jawbone. Your maxillae, which are the bones right above your um, top teeth, this kind of connects your teeth. Your nasal bones, which most of your nose is cartilage, but if you go really high up near your eyes, you'll have a little bone there, that's your nasal bone. Your orbits, which is the bony structure around your eye. And your zygomatic arches, which are your cheeks. Uh, if you haven't already, please go into your book and look at an actual diagram that have all these in there. And during class, I handed out a blank uh, form of a skull just so you can identify some of the different areas that you're going to need to know of the face and cranium. So here is an outline of the skull that you're going to see in your textbook. So here we have the separation right there is the cranium, that whole section. And then this is the face. So in the cranium, so this little area, um, which is typically what we call the skull, it's the part that protects the brain, we have several different areas uh, so that we can better label um, where a specific injury is. Instead of saying it's to the cranium, we can say a specific area. So these uh, different sections actually do have some separation to them. If you see right here, this little line, it goes around here and here. These are called sutures because your cranium is actually in different pieces that form together. Uh, if you ever heard of a baby's soft spot um, and when they're born, that's because one of their sutures hasn't actually pushed together fully yet. And so there's a soft spot where there's actually no skull. So cranium we have right here is the frontal bone, which is the front of the cranium. It's pretty easy to remember. Then behind it, this covers most of the top of your head, is the parietal bone. Then over here on the side of your head where your ear is, is your temporal bone. If you ever have taken a temporal temperature, that's on the temperature taken in the ear. So if you remember, ear is temporal. Then back here, we have your occipital bone. Occipital is uh, covering the area of the brain that actually processes vision. Um, and so input from your occipits. So those are the big sections of the cranium. And going to our face, 
you have the siphonoid bone, which is just behind the eyes. It's technically part of the cranium, but you can say it's part of the uh, face as well sometimes. Right here, you have your nasal bone, so it's this little protrudence right here. Inside of that is the lacrimal, lacrimal bone, sorry. And then surrounding the eye is the orbit, which is a very easily broken bone. Coming down here, you have your maxilla, which are connecting the teeth to the rest of the face. Your zygomatic bone or arch right here, that's what provides structure to your cheek. You can very easily feel that below your eye. And then this guy right here, the big jawbone, that's your mandible. So again, review this on your own. Um, in class, we got blank ones, and you should be able to fill out all these specific spots. So moving on, uh, you have your spinal column. Your spinal column is made up of 33 vertebrae, and uh, these vertebrae are actually separated into different segments, which we're going to talk about in our next slide. And it's essential for movement, sensation, and vital functions. That's mainly because it, inside of the spinal column is your spinal cord which we're going to discuss that a little bit later on in the chapter. Your thorax is essentially your upper chest. Um, it contains your heart, lungs, and major blood vessels. And this is where your ribs come into play. Um, wherever your ribs cover is generally your thorax. And the function of the thorax is to protect the heart, lungs, and major blood vessels. So that's what your ribs are doing. All right, so as I said, your spine is um, separated into five different segments. So in the top, your first seven vertebrae are called your cervical spine or C-spine. Then below that, you have your next 12, which are your thoracic spine. Right there. Then below that, you have your lumbar spine, which are five more vertebrae. And then you have five more in your sacrum right there and then your last four are your coccyx or your tailbone right there so some things to kind of point out uh, in your c-spine your first two have different names so c1 and c2 that's cervical one cervical two uh, that the c1 is your atlas and c2 is your axis those are two different names for it. Uh, your c-spine covers your neck it's one of the most commonly injured parts of your on spine because your neck is very flexible and mobile and it's very prone to injury. If you think of whiplash, or your neck going back and forth, it's very, very prone to having um, something happen to it. So it's a very highly injured area. And we're also worried about the C-spine because the C-spine houses the most vital functions of your spinal cord. Uh, in your C-spine, um, you're going to have your uh, it's going to be responsible for breathing, some blood pressure control, sometimes your heart rate. So a lot of your very vital things that you need to have happen are transmitted through your C-spine. So if you injure that, it could lead to immediate death. <clears throat> your thoracic spine right here is what houses your ribs. If you see, there's a set of ribs coming off of each one of your thoracic spine. And as you can see, this is labeled thoracic 1 through 12. So just like C1 through 7, you have C1, C2, C3, C4. Thoracic, you'll have T1, T2, T3, T4. Same on with lumbar, um, sacrum, and then coccyx. We don't really do a 4 just because it's um, a very small portion. We'll get to that in a minute. So you have your thoracic right there that all your ribs come off of. Then you have your lumbar right here, lumbar 1 through 5. This is your second most commonly injured area of your back. And that's just because there's not any real structure around it. Like in your thoracic, you have all these ribs that are kind of giving you some more structure. It's harder to move your thoracic back and forth. But lumbar, since we're bending down and lifting up a lot, but there's nothing that's connecting to, it's kind of more free-floating. That's where we can get a lot more injury because there's nothing really um, helping it stay in place. Moving on to your sacrum, the reason why this has less injuries is because these are fused. Um, spinal vertebrae. That's a big thing to remember is your sacrum on the spine is all fused and then your coccyx or your tailbone is also fused and that's just the little little part that you can feel um, right at the top of your butt. Um, that little protuberance it's uh, what a lot of um, animals that have tails their coccyx turns into that. 
So you have all these segments, and then each vertebrae is labeled with the letter of the segment, and then 1 through 12 depending on which order it's in. So that's how we identify things in spinal health. So your pelvis is made up of a lot of different areas. Your pelvis is uh, the big area between your torso and your uh, legs. <clears throat> the top of the pelvis um, are two big wing-like structures. It's called your ilium. At the bottom are two C-shaped structures or O-shaped, depending on how you're looking at it. That's your ischium. Your pubis is right between your two ischiums on either side. Then you have your hip joint, which consists of your acetabulum, sorry, which is the kind of receiver part of your leg. And then you have the uh, head of your femur. So the, here it's listed as the ball at the proximal end of the femur. But the head of the femur sits into the acetabulum, and that's what actually forms your hip. When someone said to, that they have broken their hip, typically that is the uh, top of your femur that sits in that hip joint that will break off. And that's what people refer to when they say that someone broke a hip. So moving down into your leg, the bone in your upper leg is called your femur. It runs from your knee to your hip. Your patella is your kneecap. Then your lower leg is your tibia and fibula. The tibia is the big flat bone that you should be able to feel that runs between your uh, kneecap and your... Uh, and then your ankle is cons consists of your lateral and medial malleolus. If you remember from your our directional uh, discussion and terminology, lateral would be the outside and the medial would be the inside. The uh, medial is typically the end of the uh, tibia and the lateral is the end of the fibula. Moving down to your foot, uh, your heel is called your calcinus. So that's the bottom of your heel. Then you have your metatarsals, which are what runs in your actual foot, the little um, small bones that you can feel in your foot. Those are your metatarsals. And then that branches into what's called phalanges, which are your actual toes themselves. So each toe has a phalange for it. Moving on into your upper extremities, <clears throat> uh, you have your clavicle, which is your collarbone. Uh, that's what runs between uh, your anterior neck and your arm. That's the clavicle. That is actually the most commonly broken bone in the human body. Uh, it's usually because of fall injuries. If someone reaches out, um, energy is transferred up from their arm when they land, when they're reaching out, and it goes into the clavicle and it will break it very, pretty easily. Then you have your scapula, which that's in your back. That's the big shoulder blade bone. Then you have your acromion process. And the acromion process is actually part of the scapula. It's the highest point of the scapula. And it connects with the uh, clavicle right at the top of your shoulder, that kind of little bony area. And that forms what we call the acro, um, acromoclavicular joint, which is a common site of a shoulder injury. Moving down, the bone that runs between your shoulder and your elbow is called the humerus. And then in your lower arm, we have two bones. We have the radius and the ulna. If you are standing in the anatomical position, the lateral bone is the radius, the one that runs to your um, thumb. And then the medial bone is your ulna, the one that runs along with your pinky finger. Moving further down the arm, you have the wrist, and then you have what are called tarpals, or carpals, excuse me. Uh, carpals are the bones in your hand, which then go down to metacarpals um, as they go closer to your fingers. And then you have phalanges, which are your actual fingers again. Phalanges and toes are the same name. Um, and the way that you can remember the bones in the hand is if you've ever known someone with carpal tunnel syndrome from typing too much and they have a lot of pain in their hand, it's uh, referring to the carpal uh, bones in your actual wrist and hand. So right here is a view of the skeleton as a whole. It kind of covers everything that we just talked about. I know the print's a little small, so go ahead and look at this in your uh, books. Uh, this exact diagram is in your book, and we did fill out a blank one of these in class. 
So a joint is when two or when a bone is connected to another bone. Uh, we have two different types of joints. Uh, it's a ball and socket joint or a hinge joint. Uh, some examples of ball and socket joint are your shoulder, uh, your humerus, uh, the joint right up there sits as a ball and socket and it provides movement um, of any direction. You can move your uh, shoulder in, out, up, down, whatever way you want. An example of a hinge joint is something like your knee. Your knee can provide movement back and forth in one direction, but it can't go in circles. So a hinge will only pivot one direction and provide movement for just one direction, up or down, side to side, what, whichever, depending on the hinge. Um, but a ball and socket, you'll have a lot more free range of motion. So those are two different types of joints that we really have to have down pat. There's a bunch of different subspecialties for joints, but those are our two big classifications that we can put most joints into. So moving on to some muscles, uh, we have three different types of muscles. Uh, we have voluntary muscles. Those are ones that we kind of call skeletal muscles. Those are ones that we have control of. It's what provides conscious movement. So your bicep or your tricep connected to your uh, upper arm, that's going to be a voluntary muscle um, that we can control and move things with. A big um, part of skeletal muscle is it does get tired. So when you're exercising, uh, you can have skeletal muscle wear out to where you can't use it because it's too exhausted. You also have involuntary muscle, which we call smooth muscle. <clears throat> These are the muscles in our internal organs, uh, such as your intestine or uh, your lungs or some of your stomach. Um, your smooth muscle, we can't consciously control it. I, you, know, you can't tell your small intestine, I want you to contract right now and move this food. It does it without us consciously knowing about it. Another key part of smooth muscle is it, it does not get exhausted. Smooth muscle will be running forever and it won't wear out on us like skeletal muscle would. A subset of involuntary muscle is cardiac muscle. Cardiac muscle is um, different and special in a way because it has what we call automaticity. And that means it has its ability to generate and conduct its own electrical impulses. So it can do that on its own without being told to. Uh, cardiac muscle is a form of smooth muscle because it also does not get tired or exhausted. It will keep on going without wearing out. So you can, as you can see here, uh, skeletal, cardiac, and smooth muscle is composed a little differently. Um, and a lot of that for skeletal muscle it can provide a lot more strength, but it doesn't wear out. Cardiac muscle is because it has to have that automaticity, and smooth muscle is so it doesn't get exhausted. So moving on to our respiratory system. <clears throat> our respiratory system has two main functions. It's to breathe in, or bring in oxygen, and to expel carbon dioxide. So we bring in oxygen via inhalation, and then we excrete our carbon dioxide via exhalation. So going into our respiratory anatomy, and this is going to be pretty vital to know for our next class, which is ventilation, perfusion, and shock. Um, so our anatomy, air enters the body through the mouth and nose. Um, the mouth and nose connect to what's called the oropharynx and the nasopharynx. Those are the specific areas before the pharynx which is kind of the back of your mouth um, and into your throat. Um, so if air is entering through your nose, it has to go through the nasal pharynx first. That's just the nose only area. And if it's going through your mouth, it goes through the oral pharynx first, which is the uh, mouth only area. And that combines into the actual pharynx, which um, no matter how it gets in via your mouth or your nose, it goes, it's going to go into the pharynx. Air then goes towards the lungs and then it goes through the, of the epiglottis, which the epiglottis um, is a little leaf-like structure. It's a flap, and it closes over the glottis. The glottis is your entrance to your trachea. <clears throat> and the function of the epiglottis is to make sure that you don't choke. If you swallow, the epiglottis is going to slam shut and cover the glottis completely. That way, food will go down your esophagus or drink will go down your esophagus, and it shouldn't be going down your trachea. So that's the function of the epiglottis. 
Moving further down um, past the glottis, you have your larynx, which is what a lot of people call your voice box. Uh, your cricoid cartilage is the lower part of the uh, pharynx. That's your Adam's apple area. So if you feel your Adam's apple, that is your larynx. Beyond your larynx is your trachea. Uh, your trachea has a bunch of little C-shaped uh, cartilage rings, so it's pretty easy to feel. Um, when you touch it, you actually get a little sick. It's one of your body's defense mechanisms because it's a um, vital area to keep free of obstruction. And then beyond your trachea, you have your lungs, which your lungs it splits off into your right and left main stem bronchus, so bronchi or bronchus. And then those will get uh, those passages will get smaller and smaller and smaller and spread out until we get to little sacs of um, very very small, using one cell thick. Um, areas that are surrounded by blood vessels, those are called alveoli. Alveoli is where gas exchange actually happens. So that's where um, oxygen that you breathe in goes into your bloodstream and carbon dioxide that you breathe out comes in from your bloodstream back into your alveoli to come out. <clears throat> Beyond your lungs, um, below it, you have what's called your diaphragm. Your diaphragm is a thin little um, muscle that runs the entirety of your thorax and that's what um, moves up or down and causes breathing to actually happen, which again, we're gonna discuss in depth in the next class, I'm talking about ventilation. So your respiratory physiology, this is how it actually works. During inhalation, your diaphragm and intercostal muscles contract. <clears throat> your diaphragm actually moves down. A lot of people think, oh, when I breathe, you know, I kind of lift up a little bit. But your diaphragm, the muscle that controls breathing, actually goes down. And that's what creates negative pressure inside of your chest because going down, um, makes a bigger space in your chest, which is negative pressure. And so uh, air actually is pulled in because you have a negative pressure environment inside your chest versus the outside. So air wants to come into that vacuum. Uh, also, when, when you're breathing, uh, your ribs will move upward and outward. That just helps create a little bit more space uh, to help, again, make that negative pressure happen. Now in exhalation, which is actually seen as a passive process. Your diaphragm and intercostal muscles will relax, so your diaphragm goes up instead of down, and when it pushes up, it pushes a lot of the air out of your lungs because you're creating less space, so it puts a lot more pressure inside of your lungs, and so the air wants to go back out to the environment, which is a lot lower pressure. So it's a passive process because if your diaphragm goes up and relaxes, it creates a lot less space, causing the air to just Naps they come out of you. And again, we're going to be discussing this a lot more in the next class with ventilation. <clears throat> Which ventilation is actually movement of gases to and from the alveoli. Um, so that is the physical movement, the breathing in, air rushing in and out. That's ventilation versus respiration. That's when you get to the alveoli and you exchange the gases between the two. So Ventilation and respiration have to be in sync. Um, we, we call it a match, really. So you have to have the mechanical movement of gases, but you also have to have the exchange of the gases between the cells and the bloodstream. Okay. 
so we're talking about actual movement of oxygen in the body and we're going to be talking about that in just a little bit longer when we go into cardiac <clears throat> you have oxygenated blood that um, is exchanged through the alveoli gets into the actual bloodstream and then it's carried back to the heart the heart then pumps it to the body once it gets to the body into the cellular levels and the capillaries which again we're going to be talking about in a minute oxygen is then transported to the cells and carbon dioxide is brought back into the bloodstream the what's called deoxygenated blood at that point because all the oxygen has gone off then comes back to the heart which then shoots it to the lungs and then the um, carbon dioxide goes into the alveoli and is exchanged for the fresh oxygen that is in the lungs from breathing. So we're going to be talking about this slide a lot more with pediatrics, but there are some important differences to note when it comes to kids versus adults and their airways. Um, some few highlights that we want to point out is the child does have a smaller nose and mouth. In a child, a uh, lot more space is taken up by the tongue. The tongue generally is at almost an adult size when you're born, but the face isn't and the um, mouth isn't, so it's going to take up a lot more space inside the mouth. And then their trachea is a lot more narrow, which means that choking is a lot easier for a kid. <clears throat> your cricoid cartilage or your Adam's apple is less rigid and less developed, which means less protection right there. And your airway structures are more easily obstructed just because they're a lot smaller. You know, if a marble going down an adult's airway is less likely to get stuck because it's a bit bigger versus a kid's airway is going to get stuck a little higher up and obstruct breathing altogether. So moving on to the cardiovascular system. Cardiovascular system we are going to be talking about a lot. Um, throughout the entire class, you know, we'll talk about cardiovascular emergencies and all that stuff, but you really need to have a good grasp on it to understand a lot of what happens in the body. So this is one of the few areas that you actually have, a, have to have a good grasp on today with talking about anatomy and physiology in whole, because it's going to relate to a lot of things that we talked about well before we get to our actual cardiovascular emergency um, discussion. So cardiovascular system consists of your heart, the blood, and your blood vessels. Your heart is um, separated into four different chambers. You have the upper areas and the lower areas. Uh, the upper areas are called the atria or atrium, and your lower areas are, are called the ventricles. You have your left side and your right side, so that divides them into the four different chambers. You have your right atria, your right ventricle, your left atria, and your left ventricle. When blood goes through the heart, it starts from the body and goes into your right atrium. It then goes into your right ventricle, which is then shot out to your lungs. When it returns to from your lungs, it goes into the left atrium, and then it goes to the left ventricle, and then it's shot out to the rest of the body. So here's another diagram. Again, it's critical that we actually look at these in your textbook and you study these. This is one of the diagrams that you have to know every part of. So just, just because we're covering it right now doesn't mean you can't um, not study this on your own. <clears throat> so when we're starting with blood, and we're going to be covering some of these structures that aren't labeled, you have from the body, down here, this is called your inferior vena cava, and up here from the body, you have your superior vena cava. So it's a vena cava, what's the main blood vessel that you get blood from your body. You have superior because going towards your head, and inferior from your feet, and that's all the blood from your lower body, kind of below your chest. And then superior is all the blood from your head and your arms. So all these come and dump into your right atrium, which is right here. From your right atrium, you go into your right ventricle. Between your right atrium and your right ventricle, you have your tricuspid valve. That's what separates these two. And the valve just makes sure that blood only moves when it's supposed to move. It's a one-way valve, 
so it brings blood um, straight down so it'll open up outwards and that slams shut back so that blood can't regurgitate back into the right atrium so right atrium through your tricuspid valve into your right ventricle right here from your right ventricle is then pushed out through your pulmonary arteries so you see we have our right pulmonary artery right here and we have our left pulmonary artery right here your pulmonary arteries um, and actually, sorry, it goes through your pulmonary valve to get there. I always forget about the pulmonary valve. So right atrium through the pulmonary valve, which I want to kind of easy to remember, into your pulmonary arteries. Now your pulmonary arteries bring blood to your lungs. Uh, one thing to remember, and it's commonly tested on, is an artery is a blood vessel that brings blood away from the heart. That's an artery. A vein is a blood vessel that brings blood back to the heart. The reason why this is important right now is the pulmonary artery carries deoxygenated blood from the body because remember blood's coming from your vena cava so it's already been used, it's already deoxygenated and it's carried through your pulmonary artery to your lungs. This is the only artery in the body that carries deoxygenated blood. That is a very commonly asked question on tests. So your pulmonary arteries are the only ones in the entire body that carry deoxygenated blood. So blood goes into your lungs on the right and left side. Gas exchange happens in the alveolize, and then it's going to come back to the heart. So you see right here from lung, you have your left pulmonary vein, and you have your right pulmonary vein. So both of these are coming back to the heart. Now veins, as we said, are blood vessels that carry blood to the heart. And since we just did our gas exchange in the lungs, these pulmonary veins, right and left, are the only veins in the body that bring oxygenated blood, or carry oxygenated blood. So remember, pulmonary arteries carry deoxygenated, pulmonary veins carry oxygenated. And they're the only blood vessels in the body where that's reversed from normal. So we have our pulmonary veins, dump into our left atrium, it goes through our mitral or bicuspid valve, and it goes into our left ventricle. Now I know it's kind of hard to remember um, which valve is which. Uh, a silly mind trick that I used was uh, um, O.J. Simpson's number, if you remember him. He wore 32 back in the day, and if you remember, try for three, that's your first one in your right atrium and ventricle. And then two, because your bicuspid, is your second one, the one in your left atrium and ventricle. So 32, 32, which was his number, that will help you determine which one goes where. <clears throat> so from your left ventricle, it then shoots through your aortic valve, which is this guy right here, and in, into your aorta. Your aorta is the major blood vessel that comes out of the heart. Another thing just to um, point out is the bottom crest right here. It's called the apex of your heart. And if you see, there's a lot more muscle right here versus the right side. See how there's a little muscle there, a lot more right here. And that's because your right side, it's responsible for pumping blood just to your lungs, which is relatively close, but your left side is responsible for pumping blood all the way through your body. So it needs to have a lot more oomph behind it when it actually contracts so that you can push it all the way through the rest of your body. So you're going to have a lot more muscle here. That's a very important thing to know about your heart. Also, between here, what separates your right and left heart, you can see it's your interventricular septum. So it's just a piece of muscle wall right here that separates the two hearts. So that's just something that we need to keep in mind. Uh, also, your, your aorta, you have your aortic out arch right here, and then you have what's called your descending aorta, which goes down. Your aorta up here can branch into several different areas. For example, you have our carotid arteries that come up here. That's one that's going to your neck. You have your brachial arteries. We're going to be discussing all these in a little bit. You also have your coronary arteries right here, um, which come off real quick. That's what actually supplies the heart with blood. It's its own circulatory system within the heart. And again, we're going to be discussing that in just a little bit. 
So the cardiac conduction system, it's a lot to grasp. Um, this is something you probably got, are going to have to go over more than once. <clears throat> um, but it's vital that we know this because it will explain a lot of what goes on in the heart, um, especially in uh, cardiac arrest and how we can help bring someone back from it. So as we discussed earlier, <clears throat> each heart or cell in the heart has what we call automaticity which, if you remember, is the ability to conduct its own electrical impulse. Now, just because every cell can conduct its own electrical impulse doesn't mean that it should. Um, there is a rhyme and re reason in areas that should be firing and areas that shouldn't be firing. Um, if every cell tried to fire all at once without following this rhyme or reason, that's where we get into some lethal arrhythmias, like ventricular fibrillation is one of them. We'll be discussing that a lot more in the CPR class. <clears throat> so this will go over the typical way that the cardiac conduction system should work. Just because this is how it should work doesn't mean that's how it works in everyone, just so you guys know. And this isn't something that we expect you guys to diagnose. This is more paramedic level things that you need an EKG machine to be able to read it. Um, so just going into the basics, we start with up here. So at the top of the right atrium is called the sinoatrial node. The nickname for this node and what we usually call it is the SA node for sinoatrial, SA. Another nickname for it is the pacemaker. <clears throat> That's because um, this is the area that every single um, impulse should be coming from. So the pacer of the heart, the pacemaker of the heart. Uh, every For a normal human, every impulse should start from this little spot right here. This is what triggers everything. We then have what are called internodal pathways, these little guys right here. It encompasses both atria. So right and left atria encompasses. And then it comes down into this little bundle right here. This is called your atrial ventricular node. Atrio for atrium and ventricular for ventricles. It's the space between your atrium and your ventricles. The common name for this is the A for atrial and V for ventricular node, so your AV node. So your pulse starts in your SA, goes through your atria, and then gathers into your AV node. Okay? When it passes through your um, atrium, it will cause a contraction that's why your heartbeat is a two-step process. It's a bum, 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 bum. The first bum is your atria contracting. So signal comes through your atria from your SA node, gathers into your AV node right here. Your AV node can actually hold it for just a split second. So your AV node holds it for the split second, then it passes through your atrial ventricular bundle. The other name for this is called the bundle of Hiss. So it's this common little bundle right here, right after, your S, or right after your AV node. It then branches off into your right and left side. And these are called your bundle branches. So you have your left bundle branch and your right bundle branch. So it's held in the AV node, goes through your bundle of hiss into your right and left bundle branch. It then comes around and encircles your ventricles right here. And these are called your Purkinje fibers. That's the um, pathways that circle your ventricles. So it start or it goes to your AV node, comes down, and circles your ventricles and your Purkinje fibers. That's what causes your ventricles to contract, which is the second part of contraction. So atrium contract that pushes the blood in the, from the atrium down into your ventricles, and then your ventricles contract, which pushes blood either to the lungs if it's on the right side, or to your heart, to your body if it's on the left side. So again, this is a lot to remember, but you are going to have to remember um, all these different pathways. Another thing to keep in mind is each one of these nodes, so your SA and your AV, and then even your Purkinje fibers as a whole can do the entire heartbeat. So it's kind of your body's backup system. If your SA node stops working, then your AV node can take over and keep your heart beating. And if your SA node goes out and your AV node goes out, then your Purkinje fibers can take over and keep your heart beating. It's 
body's backup systems. Each one of these areas have heart rates that are normal for these nodes. It's called your inherent heart rate. So up here in your SA node, your inherent heart rate for this is 60 to 100. And you'll remember that because 60 to 100 happens to be the normal heart rate for an adult human. Uh, we're, we'll discuss that in uh, vital signs and vital sign practice, but 60 to 100 is what we consider in the normal range, and that happens to be the inherent firing range of your SA node. Your AV node, on the other hand, its inherent firing range is 40 to 60. So sometimes when we see someone with a very low heart rate, we might be thinking that the AV node might be taking over for the SA node for some reason. And then when you get into your Purkinje fibers, these guys, the inherent heart rate of this is 20 to 40, which is very, very slow, not efficient enough for most people. And that's why if we ever have the Purkinje fibers taking over, it's a very, very bad thing. And it's usually a prelude to someone who is about to die. All right, some important arteries to know. And I sent out a, a handout to class, and um, while we were in class, we did a blank version of this. Uh, just to point out where all these arteries are, because it's hard to discuss it without actually seeing it. But some ones that we want to keep in mind are your coronary arteries. Those are the ones that surround your heart. Like I said, it branches off your aorta very quickly um, after your uh, blood leaves your heart, and it goes back into your heart and helps give perfusion to to the heart. Uh, if there's ever an issue with coronary arteries, like if there's a blockage or a spasm or anything like that, that's where you get some really bad chest pain, and that's where we can have heart attacks form. Moving on, we have the aorta. <clears throat> As we discussed when we were looking at the heart, the aorta branches out um, from the left ventricles, what um, the blood gets pumped into, and then it feeds most, or not most, it feeds every other artery in the body. Uh, going up, you have your carotid arteries that um, go on either side of your uh, trachea and your neck and go up to your head, feed your brain. Uh, you have the brachial arteries that are going down your arms. And then you, um, the aorta kind of turns and heads down. You have your descending aorta, which will then split into your femoral arteries, uh, which are your uh, two legs, and it goes down your femoral bone. So blood vessels as a whole, and this is something you have to, have to, have to have a grasp on. So it comes out of your heart, goes into your aorta, and branches in your different arteries. Arteries are huge. They're very, very big. Um, they have to get smaller because they're so big they have muscle around them, and gas exchange can't happen when you have a muscle um, that acts kind of like a cement wall <laughs> for the exchange. So you have to progressively get arteries to become smaller and smaller. So arteries will split off and become smaller, and that's what are called arterioles. So you see right here, we have our big artery, and then it branches into the arterioles, which will get thinner and thinner and thinner until you get um, very, very, very small. Um, and these are called capillaries. Capillaries can even be just one cell thick. So capillaries are very fragile. They can burst very easily. Uh, that's where you get a lot of your bruising is uh, burst capillary, um, especially if from minor trauma, um, you'll have some burst capillaries which bruise. Um, so capillaries is where actual gas exchange takes place. 
That's very important to know. So arteries go down into arterioles, then that goes into capillaries. That's where our gas exchange happens. So oxygen leaves, um, carbon dioxide comes on board. And then we need to return to the heart because we've exchanged the gas and we need to get back to the lungs. So we come up and we go into our venules right there. So if you think the opposite of arterioles, you have your venules. And then you come back up into veins. So veins are the bigger version of venules. So if you just think of the process in reverse, um, you've got vein into venule into capillary, just like you have artery into arterioles into capillary. So we come back up and we're going to the heart. Um, a thing to point out about veins is you have what are called valves. That's because when you're coming back to the heart, you're pretty far away from the source of blood being pumped and we've gone through such little areas in the capillaries that the pressure in veins are much 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 lower than arteries and in a lot of the veins you're coming up against gravity if you think your leg the blood has to come up from your leg to your heart so these valves since there's low pressure and you're often as fighting gravity these valves will help prevent backflow of blood so you see blood pushes through here it'll open up but then it slams shut so blood can't get back the other way. And that's very, very helpful. Otherwise, it'd be very hard for blood to actually make it all the way back to the heart because it's such low pressure. So talking about blood itself, blood is composed of four main elements. The first one is called plasma. That's kind of a yellowy substance that you can see. And if you think of having just water to hold things. Plasma is the water of your body. Um, it's more than half the volume of your blood and it's what carries everything else. Is what gives um, a lot of the mass of your blood. Um, so after plasma you have red blood cells. Uh, you have some other names for them right here. Like the scientific name is erythrocytes. Um, but red blood cell works. Uh, red blood cells their main job is to be carrying the actual oxygen to the cell and then carbon dioxide from the cell. The oxygen binds to something called hemoglobin, which is on red blood cells. And that's kind of the magnet that attracts oxygen. And it'll stick right on there and then it can be released off when gas exchange happens. So hemoglobin goes on red blood cells. Moving on, moving on we have white blood cells. Again, the scientific name down here is uh, leukocytes. Um, you might see half that word be familiar with a word like leukemia which is a cancer of uh, white blood cells <clears throat> um, white blood cells their main purpose is to fight off infection um, they they carry a bunch of different ways to take out pathogens so uh, white blood cells if you see that the count is way up that usually means that you're fighting an infection because you have a lot more white blood cells in your bloodstream um, fighting whatever pathogen that it finds then platelets are kind of fragments of cells um, that if uh, they have clotting factors that if they get activated they'll excrete and it's what helps clot um, any bleeds that you have so if you cut yourself you see that it stops bleeding after a little while that's because the platelets have activated the clotting factors to stop all that blood up so pulse um, we'll be taking a lot of pulses in this class uh, when we get to vital signs. I'll hand out a sheet that has a hundred different sets of pulses that you're going to need to take before the class ends. Um, but what is a pulse? A uh, pulse is a pressure wave of blood uh, flowing down an artery when the left ventricle contracts. Uh, that's a very technical way of saying it, but it's the um, like it says, pressure wave that you can actually feel. Um, because it's not a constant flow going through the body. It's a push, push, push of blood that goes through. Um, so we can actually feel a pulse, and we feel that by compressing an artery slightly. Usually it's done over a bone. It um, doesn't happen to ha or have to be over a bone, like your carotid artery. Um, you should be able to feel that without compressing it over a bone, but you are compressing it with your fingers. So if you compress it, um, the... Uh, pressure from your heart is actually going to push against you and you're going to be able to actually feel that pulse.
So when we talk about pulses, we have two different types of pulses. You have your central pulse and you have your peripheral pulse. Your peripheral pulse is anything that you can feel that's not in the trunk of your body. Uh, so your arms or legs, those are peripheral pulses. So in those, you have your radial pulse, which is the one that you feel on your wrist or in your thumb. You also have your brachial pulse, which you feel in your upper arm against your humerus. And then you have your posterior tibial pulse. Uh, that's the one that you feel by your ankle in your dorsalis pedis pulse, which is the one that you feel between your toes. So those are all ones that you feel on the outside of your um, or the outer parts of your body. And then your central pulses, we have two of them. Um, you have your carotid, which is the one that you feel right on your neck. Then you have your femoral, which you feel um, kind of in your pelvis area between your hip and your leg. So an important thing to remember about central pulses is they can be felt even when peripheral pulses are too weak to be felt. Um, peripheral pulses, typically, um, you can't feel them after you get to a blood pressure around 80. You don't have to remember that right now. We're, we'll discuss that later on in class. But you lose that around a blood pressure of 80 systolic. Uh, central pulses, uh, you lose your last central pulse around 40 um, systolic. So you have a lot more leeway there for someone who has a very low blood pressure. Uh, so that's why central pulses are what we feel for if someone's unconscious. In the cardiac arrest, we go for a central pulse, not a peripheral pulse, because they might be unconscious because they have a low blood pressure, and we don't want to be starting CPR on someone who still has a pulse that you can feel. So you start with the uh, central pulse when you're um, really concerned about someone who might be unconscious or someone who might not have a pulse in general. So speaking of blood pressure, um, blood pressure measures the uh, force that blood exerts, exerts against the walls of the blood vessels. You have two different numbers for blood pressure. I'm sure you've heard someone say like 120 over 80 for a blood pressure. Uh, the top number, um, which is the first number that we read off, so the 120 in that example, is called the systolic blood pressure. And that's the pressure that's in the artery as the um, left ventricle of the heart contracts. So that's the um, push of blood. That's the most force that you're going to feel in that artery at a given time. That's your systolic blood pressure. Your diastolic blood pressure, however, is the pressure that is always in your arteries. So when your um, left ventricle is relaxed and it's not pushing out blood at that time, that's your diastolic blood pressure. Um, that's the second number that you read. It's always going to be lower than your systolic. So um, in the 120 over 80 example, the 120 is your systolic and your 80 is your diastolic. We're going to go over how to take blood pressures um, in the middle of September. Uh, and we'll discuss a lot more about these readings and what they mean um, then. And throughout the rest of the class, we're going to be discussing um, blood pressures and what those mean for different situations. So perfusion. <clears throat> Perfusion is the adequate circulation of blood and exchange of oxygen and waste products. So perfusion is what we want at a baseline. That If we have good perfusion, that means that everything's functioning normally. So our oxygen and carbon dioxide is being exchanged at the lungs, and the blood is being circulated around the body, and the blood is able to exchange your oxygen and waste products at the cells. If any one of those goes wrong, it can cause a lack of perfusion. So that can be, if you're not breathing, you're not going to have perfusion because you can't exchange gases at the lungs. If you have a massive bleed somewhere, your blood can't get past that bleed, you're going to have a um, lack of perfusion because you can't get the blood uh, to an area past that bleed. If you have really low blood pressure and the blood can't move because there's not enough pressure to actually get it um, to areas of the body, you're going to have low perfusion. When you have low perfusion, we call it hypoperfusion. If you think back to medical terminology, hypo means low, and then perfusion. Hypoperfusion is another um, term for what we call shock. So if someone is not perfusing well, they are in a form of shock. And we're going to be talking about shock in the next chapter, which is literally about shock. So it's a thing to consider. 
how is the function of the respiratory system related to the function of the circulatory system? Really, these go hand in hand. Um, the circulatory system's goal is to work with the respiratory system to get um, oxygen to the body. You, know, you have to pump the blood into the lungs from the circulatory system to get the oxygen and then it has to come back and then be pumped again to the body and then pick up waste products, which will then be pumped to the lungs. So your respiratory and circulatory system are really hand in hand together. So moving on to the lymphatic system. The lymphatic system, its main function is to capture fluids that leave cells in the body and then to maintain the balance of fluid in the body. So it's going to capture and then reintegrate some of the fluids back into your body. Some of the organs in the lymphoid system is your adenoids, your tonsils, your spleen, your thymus, and your nodes, what you probably have heard of lymph nodes. Lymph nodes are collection points where you can have a lot of fluid that can be stored in there, um, <clears throat> especially if, it's, uh, if you have an infection going on, some of the fluid is infected, it's going to be in the lymph nodes and they're going to do their part to try to combat the infection, and take the infected fluid away. That's why your lymph nodes will get swollen if you have an infection because you're storing a lot of fluid in there. One thing to point out about the lymphatic system, um, when we take a blood pressure, find out, especially if it's a woman, if they've had a mastectomy, which is removal of breast tissue, um, usually as a result of breast cancer, because when they remove breast tissue, they oftentimes remove a lot of lymphatic tissue, um, especially near the armpit. And so if you do that, the rest of the arm on that side is very fragile when it comes to your lymph nodes and your lymphatic pathways. And we don't want to be putting a lot of pressure on that arm. So if you have someone um, with uh, a mastectomy history, don't take a pressure, blood pressure on that one arm. Go to the other side, even if it's inconvenient for you, because um, you don't want to be causing any harm to the already damaged um, lymph, lymphatic system on that side. Um, another big key that the lymphatic system plays in your body is um, fighting off infection and uh, keeping everything kind of clean in your body. So it does work hand in hand with like the spleen and the liver to rid the body of some toxins. So your nervous system can be divided into two separate systems. You have your central nervous system and your peripheral nervous system. If you remember back to our pulses that we just talked about, you had your central pulses and your peripheral pulses. Kind of the same idea and terminology here. Your central nervous system uh, consists of your brain and your spinal cord. Um, and then your peripheral nervous system will branch off of your spinal cord and it goes to your arms, legs, um, your head, your neck, you know, every other place, um, and it carries all these signals. And your peripheral nervous system is separated into two separate types of nerves. You have your sensory nerves. Those are what's uh, responsible for touch. So, you know, you can tell temperature or just pressure of a touch or anything else that goes with touch and feel. And then you have your motor nerves. Your motor nerves are responsible for interacting with your muscles and actually telling them uh, when to contract and when to move. Uh, you also have your autonomic nervous system. That's a subset of your peripheral nervous system. It 
um, controls involuntary motor functions. So the signals that tell your heart to beat, and signals that tell you to breathe, signals that tell your digestive system to work, those are all um, part of your autonomic nervous system because we can't control that. Um, I can't control my heart um, heart rate by myself just saying, hey, heart beat faster. Or I can't tell my stomach to digest food um, or not digest food. So that's all part of your autonomic nervous system because it automatically happens. Your autonomic nervous system can also be divided into two different types of systems. You have your sympathetic and then your parasympathetic nervous systems. Uh, your sympathetic nervous system is responsible for uh, what we call the fight or flight response. Um, it really jacks up all your body. So it, if you activate your sympathetic nervous system, your heart rate will go up, your lungs will um, dilate, the bronchioles will, your pupils will dilate. Anything that you um, think of when you have like an adrenaline rush. Adrenaline rush triggers your sympathetic nervous system. So think fight or flight with your sympathetic nervous system. With your parasympathetic nervous system, it's the opposite effect. That job is to kind of slow things down a little bit, and that's what we call the feed and breed response, where our digestive tract is activated um, a lot more, and we have more um, leanings for sexual activity uh, because we aren't in any sort of danger. Um, everything's slowed down, and we can do normal activities. So remember, sympathetic is your fight or flight, and parasympathetic is your feed and breed. And just think of what you might need in a fight or flight response and then what you might need when you're at rest and feeding, breeding, all that stuff. Um, that will help you remember the two different types of autonomic nervous systems. I know this is a lot of information. Uh, we're going to discuss this when we talk more about neurology, but it is really good, uh, important to have a good grasp on the nervous system. So your digestive system is the mechanisms by which food can travel through your body and how nutrients are absorbed and how the food is digested. It consists of your stomach, your small intestine, and your large intestine. And your small intestine actually has several different parts of it. You have your uh, duodenum, you have your, uh, pardon me, you have your duogenum, and you have your ileum. Uh, the duodenum is only about a foot long. Um, and that's where a lot of the actual nutrient absorption takes place. Um, your duogenum is a few more feet, and that's where um, the vast majority of the rest of the uh, nutrient um, uptake happens. Then your ileum is where the rest of your nutrient absorption can happen. But most of it happens in the duodenum and um, duogenum. The large intestine, um, its purpose is to kind of remove the water from any waste products and then to um, shuttle all the waste product into your colon. That's where you can excrete all your waste. So stomach will uh, kind of break down the food. It has a lot of acids in it, uh, so it breaks it down, makes it mushy, so that it can easily pass through your um, small intestine, which is where a lot of the nutrient absorption happens. And the large intestine is where we withdraw water and anything else that we don't want to excrete, and then it pushes to the colon for excretion.
So your integuminary system is your skin. Uh, your skin provides a lot of different functions. Uh, probably the most important function that it provides is protection from the outside world. It provides a barrier so that things can't get in easily. Uh, things will have to get in through mucosal membranes like your eyes or your mouth, your nose, um, some sort of port that can actually get into the body. But for most of your body, it provides a um, good barrier so that things can't get inside. It also helps with water balance. Um, it can help keep external water out, uh, which goes hand in hand with protection. It also can uh, help excrete water uh, through sweating. Um, you can get rid of water in your body if you have excess water. Um, another thing that it does is temperature regulation. So uh, if you're sweating, it, um, that water will evaporate off your skin, which will actually cool you down a little bit. So it helps with temperature regulation there. But also your blood vessels, um, if you're hot, uh, your blood vessels will dilate and bring blood closer to your skin so that the heat can kind of radiate out of you. And if you're cold, your blood vessels will actually contract and pull um, closer into your body where there's a little bit more insulation from heat. Also excretion, um, when you're sweating, um, excreting out uh, some things in the sweat that can help get rid of some toxins in your body. And also some basic shock or impact absorption. Uh, it will help protect your muscles or some organs from minor impacts. So if you get hit, um, say someone hits you in the arm with their fist, it will help protect your muscle from getting a little bit more damage than um, if there's no barrier there from the skin. So as you can see, you have your three different layers here, your subcutaneous, your dermis, and your epidermis. Your epidermis is the outer layer of skin. That's the skin that we can see and touch. It's mostly dead skin cells. Uh, most of your body has about four layers in your epidermis. Your palms will have five, uh, just because it's a high touch area, like your fingertips and palms. Um, most of this is just dead skin cells that will be slothing off when you touch things and then replaced by um, other cells. So epidermis, we don't have to worry about too, too much because most of the time this is not going to cause much issue for us that we're going to see as EMTs. When you go down below the dermis, you see you have your sensory reception receptors right below the dermis. And then in the dermis right here, this is where we start to have some issues. Because you can see you have your capillary beds, your um, artery ones, and your vein ones. You have some nerves running here. Uh, you have This is where you keep your sweat glands right here and the hair roots right there. But if you get a cut down into here, this is where you're going to start seeing some blood. You're going to have some pain. Uh, it's going to be something that we might have to treat because this is where we have actual blood, uh, blood vessels here. If you get a really deep cut, um, you will get into the subcutaneous layer. The subcutaneous layer has a lot of fat in it. You can see this is fatty tissue right here. You have bigger arteries and veins. This is where you're going to get a lot more blood uh, coming from from any wound because it is pretty darn deep. You also have bigger nerves running through here, so it's going to be much more painful. So cuts that get down to the subcutaneous layer are typically pretty significant cuts that we're going to have to actually bandage. And we usually take these people to the hospital because it's going to need um, stitches or sutures to close this back up because it's very hard to heal through all of this layer on your own without bleeding continuing for quite some time. So here's the organs in your endocrine system. We'll start up here in your pineal gland, which is in your brain. 
and that helps regulate your circadian rhythm. Your circadian rhythm is what helps regulate sleep at night. Uh, people will say that their circadian rhythm is thrown off if you have an erratic sleep schedule, like most of EMS ends up having, where you have very poor circadian rhythms. Um, moving over here, you have your pituitary gland. This is kind of what's seen as your master gland because it regulates a lot of the rest of this. So the things that the pituitary gland excretes will be chemical signals for these things, um, other organs to do their jobs. Moving over here, we have your thyroid and parathyroid glands. And their main function is to regulate your metabolic rate. And it can also regulate some blood calcium levels. Over here, we have our thymus gland over here, which is very important in the development of your immune system. You saw this um, come up in our lymphatic system uh, diagram, your thymus. Then going down here, you have your ovaries if you're a woman or your testes if you're a man. Those regulate the reproductive systems of females or males respectively. Moving over here, we have our pancreas, which is located right there. And your pancreas will regulate your blood sugar levels, as we talked about um, with insulin diabetics. So this is what regulates your blood sugar. Then moving up, you have your adrenal glands, which actually sit on top of your kidneys. Uh, your adrenal glands regulate water and electrolyte levels. So they'll excrete epinephrine or norepinephrine in your body, which helps activate your sympathetic nervous system. So moving on into your renal system, um, sometimes seen as your urinary system, it helps the body regulate your fluid levels, it filters chemicals, and it adjusts your body's pH levels. So it really helps remove toxins from the body. It consists mainly of your kidneys and then your bladder. Uh, your kidneys are what actually filtrates the blood in your body. So it um, takes urea out, takes any other toxins that you need to um, urinate out of your blood system and then it passes it down to the bladder which is a fluid reservoir for urine that's where things are stored until you're ready to urinate and actually get it expelled from your body uh, renal system is incredibly important to um, maintaining homeostasis and maintaining a good ph in your body if you've ever um, seen someone go to like dialysis Dialysis is what happens when your renal system isn't functioning properly, so we have to actually cleanse the blood for you. So we take the blood out of your body, we'll cleanse it, and then put it back in your body. And that's usually a temporary solution. Um, and if your kidneys fail too much, uh, then you have to get a, um, a kidney transplant because you can go off of living with just one kidney that's functioning normally. But... Um, we do deal with a lot of dialysis patients, uh, and a lot of dialysis patients are very unhealthy in other aspects of their life because their body can't continually get rid of these toxins, and that's going to affect a lot of your other systems. So going into some major um, functions of the renal system and organs, right here we have our kidney, which we have two of these right here, and if you remember from um, endocrine, we have our adrenal glands that sit on top of the kidneys. The kidneys, as I just said, are mainly responsible for filtering the blood. So kidneys will then uh, pass down into the bladder, which is right here. So your urinary bladder. Your urinary bladder, uh, sorry, it does pass down through your ureters, which is this side. Sorry, the text is a little small. See. So kidneys will put toxins and urea into your ureters either side, and then that goes down into your bladder. So your bladder is where urine is stored. And then when you're ready to urinate, it will be excreted out your urethra, which in a man is through the penis. And then a woman, your urethra is uh, part of your vaginal anatomy. One thing to note between men and women is a um, man, since you have the external penis, your know, urethra is much, much longer than a female, which is only a couple inches because you don't have an external organ to um, get it out of. And that's important because uh, UTIs or urinary tract infections are much more common in females because you have such a shorter urethra. So um, bacteria has a much shorter way to travel before you 
urinate again, which will usually push a lot of the bacteria out. So urinary tract infections, it can happen in men, but it's much more common to see in females. So over here, we'll start up at the uh, breast. The breast, its main function is to produce milk for uh, newborns. Okay. And then moving over here, you have your ovary. The ovary, you have two of them, um, but right here and right here. And the ovary's main job is to produce an egg, um, which we'll discuss in a second. It also will excrete... Um, your female hormones such as estrogen and progesterone. So it does have a place in the uh, endocrine system, as we talked about before, of producing those hormones, which will help regulate the body. So you have two ovaries, and then the ovaries connect to fallopian tubes, which are these guys right here. The fallopian tube's job is to transport an egg or ovum to the uterus. So egg is stored here in the ovary, and it's released, it's transport, transported down the fallopian tube into the uterus, which sits right in the middle. Uh, the uterus, its main job is to be the um, site of development for a fetus. Uh, we're going to be discussing that a whole lot more in our OBGYN lecture, so we aren't going to really talk about that too much right now. And then moving on, so we have that as a full system, and then you have the cervix that separates the vagina from the uh, uterus and fallopian tubes and ovaries. So after the cervix, you have the vagina, which is the external organ, so it's about right there. And its main job is to receive semen during intercourse and also be a birth canal. So it's the transport pass passageway between the uterus and the outside world, whether that's semen going to the uterus or a child coming out into the world. You also have the vulva, which is the external part of the vagina. Um, this is the lips that you'll see. And its main job is to protect the vaginal orifice and um, the urinary tract. It's just providing a little bit of tissue to protect that area. So we have several different parts of the um, male reproductive system that we want to highlight. Um, we'll start right here. You have your testes, which sit down in the scrotum. Uh, your testes' main job is to produce sperm and also secretes uh, testosterone, which is the male hormone. That's why it's also part of the endocrine system. Um, some other little areas. Um, on top of the testes, we have the epididymis. And its job is to store sperm, so it's produced by the testy, and then it's stored at the top. <clears throat> uh, once it's time for the sperm to be ejaculated, you have several different factors coming in. Uh, you have your van's deferens. That's what transports the sperm from the testes to the urethra. And on the way, you hit the seminal vesicles, the prostate gland, and the bulbothrial gland. It's Kind of hard word to say, I always struggle with it. And all three of these, they're trying to produce fluid for the semen. Once it's transported and picks up all the fluids, it goes into the penis, and that's what actually delivers the semen during intercourse. As an EMT, your knowledge of anatomy or structure and the functions or physiology of the body will be very important in allowing you to assess your patient and communicate your findings with other EMS personnel and hospital staff accurately and efficiently.
Some of the body systems that we covered today are the musculoskeletal system, the respiratory system, cardiovascular system, the nervous system, digestive system, integuminary system, endocrine system, renal system, and reproductive systems, both male and female. Keep in mind that your cellular metabolism requires a constant supply of oxygen and glucose. Absence of either component disrupts normal metabolism. Also keep in mind that your cardiopulmonary system combines the functions of the respiratory and cardiovascular systems to provide oxygen at the cellular level. Also remember that shock occurs when the cardiopulmonary system fails and then cells become hypoperfuse, so low perfusion. The body is composed primarily of water and this fluid is distributed throughout the body systems. All right. So I'll have a question that we can think about. When evaluating a patient with a cardiac problem, consider the impact on the respiratory system. When evaluating a patient with a respiratory problem, consider the impact on the cardiovascular system. What impacts do problems in these systems have on each other? And going back to when we were talking about like the chain of life, if you have an issue with one, you're going to have an issue with the other. So again, going back to a major bleed in the body, that's a cardiovascular problem if you're bleeding. But if you're bleeding, you can't transport um, oxygenated blood to a site below that bleed because it can't get through the artery. So um, even though it's a cardiovascular problem, it can also be a respiratory problem because you can't deliver the oxygen needed, which is what the respiratory system is there to do. Shock must be recognized immediately. What is the pathophysiology of shock? This I actually don't want you guys to answer right now because this is going to be the next uh, chapter and next lesson on ventilation, perfusion, and shock. You are treating a patient who was recently released from the intensive care unit with a massive infection, which we call sepsis. This has impaired the patient's ability to regulate the size of blood vessels. How might this affect the patient's ability to compensate for any additional illnesses? What steps should you take to help this patient compensate? Again, this is kind of something that I don't want you guys answering right now. Wait until we talk about shock and we'll be able to identify all these different things that we can do and identify uh, to help treat someone with a condition like this. So keep this question in mind for uh, the next lecture, which is chapter seven. And that brings us to the end of uh, this one. As I said, anatomy and physiology is a huge topic. I can't teach it to you all in just one sitting in an hour and a half. Um, I know the class time took four hours. This one with me just talking to you is about an hour and a half. You know, again, it's there's two whole college courses that's typically the breadth of anatomy and physiology that most medical prof professionals have to take. So being able to just hit the highlights gives you guys a start, but you really have to study and study and study all this. All of this information that we covered, you should know backwards and forwards. So look at all the diagrams. So most of these are all in your textbook. I gave you guys handouts in class. Um, there's blank fillable ones out. You should be able to fill these ones out from memory and make sure that you have a good grasp on all these different topics. Again, when we talk about the specific areas throughout the course, we'll review anatomy and physiology, but have a good basic grasp on all the different areas before then because things do work hand in hand with each other, just like the cardiac system and the respiratory system will work hand in hand. So just because we're in the cardiovascular emergency section doesn't mean you can get away with not knowing the respiratory system at that time because it does work hand in hand. So hope you guys enjoyed all this. I know it's a lot to take in and uh, we'll see you for chapter seven.